Um, shamans are actually people who know that there is much more than we can see around us, there's much more that, than we can feel, that we can hear. And not only do they know that it does exist, but they also can work with it. They can not in a way manipulate it, but they can actually work in these realms that for us are seemingly not there. And you can do lots of things with that. You can heal yourself, um, you can look what your future is going to bring for you, you can alter your future, you can do things in your past um, in a way that your past is not really hunting you anymore. There's lots of things you can do. Shamans know this, but you can also misuse that. And shamans from Africa were taken as slaves in the direction of America. A group of them landed on Jamaica and actually they were really badly treated by all the white men that brought them there and they used their powers in a way actually not to heal but to damage people. With knives you can operate, with knives you can also scar people and you can really damage them and wound them. That's actually what food is. It's a, it's a form of shamanism used in a way that's not really nice, very nasty. Do you want to continue from, on, on from there? Do you want to talk about the, uh, the way that shamans view the spirit world? Do you know something about yeah, that? I, the I, landscape I, of, the, of the spirit world? You showed this interesting photograph, uh, uh, sorry, this drawing in your lecture where it had the tree and all the stars and this was an alchemical view of, uh, mm. of, of an otherwise invisible realm. Do you yeah. want to just talk about that, that image that you used? Yeah, most, um, most shamans are, um, will say that beside the world we live in, there's also worlds we will live in after we die or before we came to this world. They strongly believe in reincarnation, there's different worlds, and those different worlds um, you can go to after you die. And from there you come back to this world of three-dimensional, hard, dense reality. And for them, that other world is actually much more important than the world we live in. For them, that world is where it all happens. Here you live through some kind of experience, and the experience you live through in this world is the experience you choose to live through before you came here. But what they believe is that wounds that were inflicted at you to you when you were in a previous life, you take with you in this life. So for them, it's very um, important to go to these other realms, heal your wounds that were inflicted in previous lives. So in this life, you're much more healthier and you can die in a much more healthier way. And the healthier you die, the more conscious you die, the more chance you have to stop reincarnation. Um, that's actually the, the, the ultimate goal is not to come back. It's a kind of drug, it's a kind of... Uh, like smoking, um, it's, it's, it's not a good experience, it's, it's something bad, you choose for it, but the ultimate goal is to stop it. And, and to stop returning to the physical Yes, yes, realm. and to move on to higher realms, to higher and higher and higher realms. And the way to do that is to die consciously, to be aware that you die. And the more aware you are that you die, the more chance you have that you will land on a good spot. When you die unconsciously, it doesn't mean that you land on a wrong spot, but you land on a spot that you still have to walk home a long way. You will get home, you will get there in the end, but it takes a long time before you do get there. So for, for these people, it's very important that they die as consciously as possible. It's not only people in South America who think that, it's also Tibetan uh, who believe they have even uh, the Fowa, I think it's called the monks train themselves that when they feel that they are now that old that they're going to die shortly, they meditate themselves to death because they don't want to die ill or subconscious, in a subconscious way. They want to be fully aware that they are dying. And that's actually um, what's so important for these people. Um, I know a little bit about Inca shamanism, what, how they perceive the, say, the world after life. And in their fishing, there are about five worlds. And um, when you die, 
depending on how you die, how healed you were and how rare you were when you die, you land up in one, two or three of these worlds. And the lowest world of that, um, that's a strange world, they call, it, they call it the stone world. And that's a world where everything is dark, there's no light, so you're tapping around. It's a very, actually a very nasty place to be. Um, the second world is the plant world, that's already much more friendly. The third world is the animal world. The fourth world is the world where we have our collective consciousness. And there's a fifth world where actually you will never go because that's a kind of world that's reserved for gods. So they have different landscapes. These worlds have different landscapes. The stone world has stones, the plant world has plants, and the animal world has animals. And uh, you can land up in one of these worlds. In the end, you will all arrive in the fourth world. You will all cat there. But if you go there straight away, you don't have to cat home anymore. You're home. If you first go to the stone world, you have to go the whole way to actually the fourth world. And then it can take a long time. You can be helped. You can even be helped while you're already dead. A good shaman can help you, can, can communicate with you, can direct you and show you the right way and bring you directly from this lower world to this higher world. In, in, in this uh, fourth realm, what uh, do we do? Is there, you know, houses, huts? I don't know enough about that to, to actually elaborate on that, what, what we do there. I know that it uh, looks very much like you and me will look very much like here. That you will have some kind of human form um, and it's actually the most friendly world of the four worlds I've described. Have you ever um, heard anything about groups of spirits joining together to try and communicate and help people who no. spend all their times in, in the spirit world trying to communicate, trying to guide mm -hmm. and help people? Actually, I, I, actually, I have not heard of groups of spirit to help people. I know the other way around of people helping uh, groups of spirits. So, so we seemingly we do help from this realm. We do help people in the spiritual realm to get home. The other way around, I know only from um, cases like healing. There you could say if healing occurs, something from the spiritual world steps in and that's what all the healers say. The healer steps away, steps outside actually of this 3D reality. Let spirit come in and spirit is doing the work. So there you can say that the spiritual world is coming into this world to actually heal us or do something. And I have seen very um, strange and really mysterious cases with this. Really, even myself, I've gone through healings which I cannot even explain with uh, toothaches that I had for days and in 30 seconds it was gone. Uh, things like that. And you think that uh, that's because there's been a communication opened and a, a spirit has come through and helped the situation? Actually, I asked the healer what happened and this is what the healer said. I step aside, I make room, I make place, I'm a conduit, I'm actually it works through me, I'm not doing anything myself, I just make place, I'm just the instrument, it comes through me and helps you. And so it comes from another realm, it's not the healer is doing it. Have you ever had any experience uh, with shamans that use naturally occurring fungi or roots or saps or herbs like ayahuasca? Mm. Because in shamanism, if there's something wrong with the person, uh, it's the shaman that takes this uh, ancient herbal mixture. Yeah. And not always is it given to the patient. It's no. used as a tool for the shaman to be able to see into the patient and identify what the problem is. Yeah, I've... No, I only know it that it exists. I know I, ayahuasca shamans, the San Pedro shamans. Um, I've not met them and um, the shamans I've worked with were actually shamans that did not use anything to get in a state of altered consciousness to see what's wrong with you. They describe some kind of luminous energy field that they have around you that can be seen. Everybody actually can learn that. 
you can learn it, I can learn it. It's a way of, of actually perceiving the world. And in this field, they see what's wrong with you. So if you have something with your kidneys or whatever, they will see in your luminous energy field disturbances and they can pinpoint from this and this is wrong. And let's try to actually restore your luminous energy field. So what they say, if you are ill, you don't have an illness, but actually you're lacking health. And that's a complete different concept. So it's not that you have a disease, but actually something is missing. And we will restore that. We will reconnect to your healthy blueprint. And if I reconnect you to your healthy blueprint, you will be healed again. Mm, that's interesting because, you know, I had a neighbor who was, he was about 77. And he used yeah. to take any drugs. He refused. He said the body can heal itself. Just yeah. eat good, plenty of sleep, and the body will sort it out. Yes, body is pretty powerful yeah. and um, in a way a healer is actually trying to reconnect you with your blueprint and gets help from what the healer calls the spiritual world, from spirit. And spirit, if you really think about it, is nothing else than us at a higher level, collectively us again. Mm -hmm. So in a way we do help each other and help ourselves. There is a lot of compassion there, isn't there, for the spirits to help. And we live in a world where we're bombarded with these antagonistic characters and all these soap mm. operas. Do you, do you think that um, the people that die, who've never lived out of their higher self, have refused to see the divinity and the spirituality of certain aspects of the planet and nature, do you think that somehow what's going on here in the physical plane is harming? or damaging, or twisting or distorting the natural balance in the spirit world? Mm, it's What's happening here on Earth is not really disturbing, I think, the spiritual world, not in the way that you would think it, but what does do, what it does do is that it makes it so more difficult to die in a way that you get home very quickly and very easily. So, if you die um, let's say in an accident, what can happen is that you're not even really aware that you're dead, that you somehow how even don't land in the stone world. But it, if you do land there, it's a long way home. And I think what's happening right now on this planet is people get so not aware anymore of how this all works, that they all die in a state of mind that they have to walk home a long way. They will all get home. It's not that you never get there. It's only a very, very, very long walk. The more you are aware of how this second world or third world looks like, and the more you are aware that you're going to die, you die more consciously, the walk will be much more so shorter. Mm. Well, um, you know, we've been to these old castles where they've got ghosts that have been there. You know, the first sighting was written down and it's been there for like 200 years. Yes. Is this a sign that there's a spirit there that's died and it's taking 200 years as a lost spirit to actually eventually find the so-called fourth world? That's um, The spirits in castles, that's, um, if you really think about it, it's a very strange concept. Yes, people have died likely in very nasty circumstances and um, they did not really get to one of the worlds, they're somewhere in between the worlds. But shamans have a time perception of zero. Actually, what they say is when you step outside this 3D world, you go in the other realm, there's no real time. Now, this is very strange. So actually, there is not a thing like reincarnation. All the incarnations take place at the same time. It's a very difficult concept. Though we place it time in time and we even go back to a previous life and we repair things in previous lives so it doesn't inf influence this life, actually there is no real time. So 200 years of coast going around is not actually 200 years, it's just it's in between the worlds and it's not really 200 years there. It's a very difficult concept. It takes a lot of explanation and a lot of deep inner search to get a feel of this idea that we do live in sequence of time, although time does not exist. And what would be the solution to uh, help that spirit? 
been stuck there for 200 years, been seen by tourists. Uh... Yeah, you can get the, the, the day's coast, you can get them back, you can even communicate with them, and you can point out to them from, look, this is a situation, you're in between the worlds, and actually you can tell them there is the exit. Step through that door and you will be fine. It's actually, it's doable. And the spirit, the ghost will disappear. It will be gone. It will go to the higher world and you will never see him back. Or... Wow, that's good. We can have a break and then change Is there anything you want to add, Bert? No, no, no. Unless, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy, yeah. It's very good. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Just, I liked it. Just in the chair, I'm just focusing on this thing. I get the impression that there is someone who works with the human spirit. Yeah. And he has a very strong sense of humour. Yeah. And he's a very good writer. Yeah. And he's very good at writing. Yeah. So I'm just trying to get some little bit of information about this. Okay, I will stay here. Just, uh, just, just a minute or two. Just let me see if I can get it. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Because I can kind of see, I just got the impression that you have a kind of face coming over you. Just for like one second, a face coming over your face. I thought, oh, you know, yeah. the kind of double face. And I thought, what's happening to you? Okay. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it takes a bit of time. To okay. In, but it can. It can be. I have. What I explained. I have gone through this all about two weeks ago in Arizona. I went through and even went through these worlds. You can even you yourself can go there. Well, before you die. Oh, yeah. You can travel into them. Yeah. You can see who's there. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you said the stone world was the first one. Yeah, it's very nasty. It's not what nice. I'm interested in is. Do you know, remember these pictures of Jung, the first one that yes. Janet shows? That's very much how the stone world looks oh, like. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's amazing how that's, that's very, come, very interesting. how that comes together. But you can go there. I was taken to these worlds to look for my father. Wow. And to see where he is and to see if, that's, if he's in the right place. And if not, then get him back here. Yeah. And... Um, direct him the right place. That's really, really good. It's amazing, I can tell you. Yeah. Yeah, I've done that. You see, this is a very positive thing, you see. It's yeah, this is positive, all, yeah. All, all these people die in terrible fear. Yeah. And they, they end up dying on, on, a, on a trolley, in a, in, in a corridor, yeah. in a hospital. Nobody cares about them. And they, they can land up very, they can end up very, in a very nasty place for a long time. And that's not really a long time, it's a long way home. You have to go through all kinds of things to get actually then to the place you want to be. Wow. And, and that's mainly because they don't die in a conscious way, in a very aware way that they are dying. So even you can die on a trolley, that's no problem in the corridor of a hospital, as long as you are fully aware what's going on. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much need that there's somebody who laughs you, you can do it all on yourself, as long as you know, okay, I'm making the transition now, it's all right, I'm fine, I will be fine, mm -hmm. I'm going to do that right now, bye-bye, and I step to the next world. Well, that, you know, that's a form of enlightenment. Of what these all these different yeah. kinds of traditions are called enlightenment. You have a few of these monks that died while they were meditating, and they actually um, came into a kind of state of um, fossilization. It looks like, and so they're still sitting there. And um, um, there are a few monasteries where they have the, these monks just sitting there. They died. I don't know how many decades ago. And they mummified. Oh, and they're still sitting in this, they actually meditating themselves to the next, through the transition. They died very conscious, very aware. Yeah, I've seen um, some of these mummies in South Africa, uh, sorry, South America. Yeah. And it's interesting, there's a lot of parallels between 
South America and say Egypt. Yeah. And also in South American communities up in the really high altitude countries, Peru and the Himalayas. Because uh, you have mummif mummified bodies in South America, the same as you have in Egypt. Yes, and the, the similarities between all these forms of shamanism um, is likely because they have something like a grid and they can go in an altered state and do what they call grid walking. So they walk actually around the earth and they meet each other. So the aboriginals and the shamans from South America, um, they have met already for centuries and for thousands of years on these higher levels. So they go in a state of mind and kind of meditational state. They travel on the grid lines in uh, sometimes it's called dragon lines. They have different names in different cultures to meet each other and to exchange ideas and a uh, few points of what they are working with. And that's why you will see lots of similarities between all these indigenous people around the world. Are these dragon lines what we in, in, in Europe would call ley lines? There's, there's a strong connection between ley lines and dragon lines, yeah. Mm. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, it is. Brilliant. Next. <laughs> Next. <laughs>